Welcome to DRD 132 from home. Instead of being in class, you get to hear me talk to you on this video. And this will be a little review of the lecture we had the other day about anatomy. And we'll talk about categories just a little bit, but we'll basically go over anatomy in a way that hopefully it starts to reinforce and you remember it a little bit better with some examples here. Instead of looking at a lot of PDF sheets and a lot of things on the web that are all over the place. Now, I don't know if this will be in a perfect order. I'll try to go in alphabetical order as much as I can, but I just want to point out the important parts of anatomy as we go through this. Now, and before we get into that, some of the basic things I'm assuming you should know already is that this is a serif font, this is a serif font. Now this is more of an old style, there's a little more angles. If you zoom in here and look at the A, there's kind of an angle there on the, the top of the A of that little, I guess that's a finial that's coming around on the A with a little ball terminal on it, sort of, and we'll talk about that. But there's a little more of a handwritten calligraphic kind of look to this one. It's a little softer, whereas the one up here, this Caslon, is a little more generic in terms of a serif font. The axis of stress, which the axis of stress, let me zoom in here. This is the axis of stress. And that basically means that inner circle that you'll see on B's and O's and, and kind of open letters kind of has an angle. Like, you know, if you think of the earth on its axis tilted a little bit, that's kind of tilted a little bit. So uh, the thin part is up here. And that's also something we'll talk about is the contrast. How thin is that compared to the thicker part? This is a little bit more of a transitional font because it has very thin and a little bit heavier. This is a little more uniform, not quite, but this is a little more thin. It has a little more thinner parts to it. So it's getting closer to being modern and transitional is kind of in between. Now, modern, let me just show you modern. I have a page here with modern. Modern often has high contrast between their strokes. This is a primary stroke, a secondary stroke, but look at that, very thin, very thick. In here, very thin, very thick, and these don't work well at small sizes, so you'll see these in more display kind of uses rather than a lot of body copy. Although there can be some that can be used for some limited body copy, but these are just three examples here. This probably the most extreme with the very thin and thick, but also very thin and thick here. And usually they have lower X heights, and again, you should know what X height is. That's the height of the lowercase letters. It's also called the mean line. The line that goes across here, they call that the mean line. You should know that the baseline is what the letters sit on. And you should also know that the parts of the letters that go below the baseline is the descender. Y is a descender, G has a descender, P, J, all these are descenders. And ascenders go above the mean line, or they go above the X height, like the F, the B, the F, the D, the B, and so on and you should know that kind of stuff. The cap height is really the, the height of the capital letter, which again, isn't always the tallest thing. Right here, you can see the H, lowercase h, goes higher. The ascender on that lowercase h goes higher than the T. So that's just one way of measuring things. And point size actually measures from the highest ascender to the lowest descender. So you don't just measure the capital letter to figure out the point size, although sometimes there's tools that do that. But really, the block of type used to contain the entire letter size containing both ascenders and descenders. So that's kind of the basic stuff. Uh, baseline, cap height, ascender, descender, x height, mean line. You should know that these have serifs on them. Uh, the parts on the bottom are considered serifs. These little feet here. I'll zoom way in here. And these are more bracketed harshly. They have more angular kind of bracketing to them, meaning where the stem or where the stroke meets the feet and it makes kind of a serif at the bottom. This is very angular, whereas if I go down to the other ones, down here, the bracketing is very smooth. And actually, the ends of the serifs are very smooth and kind of rounded. And there's even something here called cupped, where it kind of goes up a little bit. It's not very straight on the bottom. So it's very cupped up there. So that those are the serifs. You should know that. And let's zoom back out again. Again, old style, transitional modern, really high contrast. Now let's dig into some things a little bit. Uh, we talked about axis of stress. That's the, you know, kind of, if you look at a letter O, that angle there, that's the axis of stress. Sometimes there's an angle, sometimes they're very straight. This one is a little more straight than this one. And the modern ones are often very straight up and down. There's almost no angle there. It's almost, you know, going from top to bottom. Now, some of the terms I wanna go over right now, uh, I kinda have them in alphabetical order. We'll talk about a couple things. We'll talk about arms. We'll talk about stems. And I guess a good way to look at this, I'll zoom into just this one up here. I don't have to be 
on both fonts here, but in, in terms of the stem, it's usually the part of the of the letter or the character that is the main part. So here's the main stroke of the P, and that's considered the stem because there's something coming out from it. Now what's coming out from this is kind of a circular shape, which is the bowl and the counter. Now if you forget which one is on the outside, actually the bowl is on the outside, just like a cereal bowl, and the cereal or the counter is on the inside. So if you remember BC, B like a bowl is on the outside, and the inside would be the cereal, that's where the counter is. So that has a bowl and counter, this has a bowl and counter. The E has an I, so they call that the I of the E in there. And as we're talking about some of these lowercase letters, this end of the E, which I don't know what that would be, it's actually called a finial, just like the end of the C. Where's a C? Here's a C, they call that a finial down here. And now if that's a finial and that's a finial, what would you call this? I would call this uh, the terminal. And that's actually a ball terminal, just like the R has a ball terminal. Now this might have another term, I'm not sure yet, of the top part of the C, but that does have a ball terminal just like that has. Terminal just means the end of a letter, but finial usually means when it's tapered off. So sometimes even a T can have a finial, like over here. This can also be considered a finial. So the T can be a finial, that could be a finial. You can almost consider that a finial, although that almost has a ball terminal at the top. And by the way, this is a two-story or double-story A. It doesn't just have a circle with a line like some sans serif fonts do. That's a double-story A. And some other things I want to mention here. Just on the Z, that's the stroke. Uh, the Y has kind of a primary stroke. Sometimes they're called an arm. If something's shooting out from it, it's an arm. Just like if we look at the K, and let, let me go to the capital letters for a second. If I would look at the T, I would say that's the stem, the main stroke, and then there's there's an arm going across the top. Anything where something's sticking out. This has kind of a stem, the Y has kind of a stem, and it has two arms coming out. This has kind of a cross stroke. I wouldn't really call that a stem. This has kind of, you know, different strokes here. I would just call these, their strokes. I don't know if I'd call one the primary one as a stem. The L looks like it has a stem and has an arm coming out the bottom. The E has kind of a stem and three arms coming out. The F has two arms coming out. And while we're talking about those, they also have beaks. These have beaks sticking down. Now, you might just call them serifs, but they call them beaks when they're up at the top. So these little things here are called beaks. The Cs have beaks on them. Now, I pointed to the top. They're actually the barbs. The beaks are down at the bottom. Now, why do I say that? Because this one has beaks, but there's no barbs. So barbs kind of stick up. Sometimes they'll even stick up on Fs, but they're not sticking up down here. So when we see beaks, we'll see beaks here. We see a beak here. This S has a barb. There's a barb. And beak, 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 beak. And the beaks are on the arms here. You could call that a barb up here. That has a beak and a barb. When it kind of sticks up and it's like a little extra hook on it. Now this does not have a spur. Sometimes Gs will have a spur on. This thing is a spur. It's like a little goatee thing. A spur. Although, you know, I've seen other things about spurs. I could almost call this thing a spur on the D. You could almost call that a spur because I'm not sure what else you would call that. So that could be a spur. On the U, that could be considered a spur. So if you called that a spur, I'd be okay with that. This thing on the A, I wouldn't call that a spur because it's kind of tapered like a little finial at the end. But you could call that thing a spur. You could call this thing a little sort of a spur down there. That thing could be kind of a spur, but primarily you see them on G's. So, you know, that's the main place you'll see a spur. So back to the capital letters, we talked about barbs, the, the little things on the top. Barb, barb, barb. Well, they could be on the bottom too, but as long as they kind of stick out from the opposite side of where the beak is. This Z over here has beaks on it. That has a beak and a beak. We'll just look at this one down here to see if it has the same thing, and it does. And this one almost has a little barb on that. So, you know, how would you describe it? It has a little barb. And look over here, the T actually has barbs on the top of its arm. It has little beaks coming down and it has barbs going up, which makes it unique. And again, this is all helpful to kind of identify fonts. Some other things, apex is kind of the tip of the A, vertex is the bottom of the V. They call this part in here that where they meet the crotch. They call this thing on an A the crossbar. An easy way to remember crossbar is to look at an H 
because it looks like an old goalpost before they had the Y-shaped goalposts, but it has a bar going across, and it's connecting two strokes. In the A and the H, it's connecting them. And then also, I would also call the T and the F a crossbar. Now, sometimes they'll say the T is just an arm sticking out, but typically the the F and the T, especially the way you draw them, handwriting kind of goes through them. Let's look at this one up here. And see, that's kind of hard. I've seen that referred to as a barb with an arm coming out. But if you called that the crossbar, that's fine. Or the bar, that's fine. Especially the F. I mean, the F's going right through that. The T, it's questionable whether it's going through it. It could be an arm with a barb. But, you know, I, I wouldn't make a big deal about that. As long as you know how to describe it and you're not, you know, just kind of at a loss for words. So, again... Finial, I see finials here, I see finials, I see finials on the E's, I see a bowl and a counter, I see a bowl and a counter, and they don't always have to be closed, they can be open, and here I'm looking at a G, a G, remember, has those three terms, it has the ear, the little thing on top, it has the link, which connects it, and it has the loop at the bottom. Now, sometimes a G can just have a terminal at the bottom. Sometimes they'll call them a tail. Now, let me mention tails for a second here. Q has a tail, very decorative one on that one. And this has a tail, kind of going in the opposite direction. Even this R has a little bit of a, a tail to its leg. Now, this is the leg of the R. This is the leg of the K. See, a K, I would say this is the arm. This is the stem. This is the arm. And that's the leg. A capital L has a stem and it has an arm coming out at the bottom. So that's the way I would refer to them. And if you refer to them, that's fine. This U, you could say that actually has a, a bowl to it. And this is the counter on the inside. I wouldn't say that with a V, because remember, we have the vertex. We have the, the crotch in the vertex, so I wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, when referring to Vs and Xs and some of these, I would just say strokes. I would say the X has two strokes, kind of a primary and a secondary. I would say the W has two primaries and two secondaries. I wouldn't talk about arms shooting out and things like that, because they, they vary based on how they're designed. The S has something called a spine. That's kind of the curvature of where the where the bottom hook meets the top hook and i guess i should say the top bowl and the bottom bowl because really they're kind of a they're kind of an open bowl and an open bowl with a counter in the inside counter in the inside same thing here on the r there's a bowl with a counter on the inside and then it has a leg coming out sometimes it'll have a foot or a serif type uh, part on the bottom this J, you could say, has a tail. In this case, it kind of does. You could also say it's a ball terminal kind of tail on it. But it, since it does sink below the baseline, you could call that a tail, but you could be more specific and call it a ball terminal. So again, stem, if it has arms coming off of it. If not, you could just call it a stroke. I would just call that a stroke. You know, most letters have strokes. Now, C's, remember, C's and G's, they're kind of a bowl. So you could say the you know, the bowl and the counter on the inside, even though it's not closed. Same thing with the G. G kind of has a serif. I'd call that a serif in here. You could call that a beak, because they have a beak up here. I guess you could call that a beak. I'd have to double check on all the parts of a G. This thing has a bowl that's not closed, and the counter on the inside is, is open. So if you had something in there, it could, could leak out. You know, this is a diagonal stroke. You'd refer to this, this stroke on the Z. You'd say, oh, well, the diagonal stroke, because it's going in a diagonal. You would say the V has four diagonal strokes. And any other things here I don't want to miss. We'll go back to lowercase. Something called shoulders. The M's have shoulders on them. The N has shoulders. The H can have a shoulder. Again, one last thing just to point out. The terminal is where something ends. This F has a terminal up here. You could say it's a ball terminal. Uh, you know, anything that ends without a serif, you could call a terminal. So the F kind of has a terminal. Uh, I guess this J could have a terminal at the end, although this almost has a tail down here. So sometimes they get more specific. So if you just understand that stroke is kind of the base one, sometimes a stem will have arms attached to that. I think you're okay. We covered spine, we covered shoulder, we covered spur. I think we covered spur in the G. We said that's a spur, although lowercase letters could have what looks like to be a spur. We talked about barbs, and I think that's okay. So hopefully you'll remember some of that. Hopefully this helps a little bit. I don't want it to be too boring, but I want you to kind of reinforce this as much as possible so that when you talk about fonts, you can kind of use this terminology. So if I think of anything else, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up or I'll record another video. But hopefully that helps a little bit from what we talked about the other day and some of this anatomy terminology. And we'll have some other things where we'll, we'll be classifying our categories also a little bit more.